Are you looking to expand your aesthetic practice and attract high-quality new patients? Discover the power of digital marketing in growing your practice with a personalized strategy session. Join Ryan Davies, Equa's marketing director, for an exclusive 90-minute meeting. Ryan and his team will invest hours prior to your session, crafting a customized marketing plan tailored specifically for your practice. This invaluable opportunity comes at no cost to you. With no commitments attached, schedule your meeting with Ryan today by visiting www.businessofaesthetics.org MSM and take the first step towards transforming your practice with the potential of digital marketing. You're invited to join our exclusive monthly webinar brought to you by the Business of Aesthetics community. Don't let this chance slip through your fingers. Secure your spot now for a game-changing experience. Explore the details on our homepage at www.businessofaesthetics.org and get set to transform your strategies. You are listening to another episode of the Business of Aesthetic podcast series brought to you by our gold sponsors, Equa Marketing. If you would like to network and share your experience with our podcast guests and other aesthetic industry professionals, join our Facebook or LinkedIn communities by searching for Business of Aesthetics. Prepare to be inspired as we introduce an esteemed professional in the field of plastic surgery. Meet Dr. Lauren Umstadt, a board-certified plastic surgeon of exceptional repute, practicing in the vibrant locale of Leewood, Kansas. Her expertise and dedication have earned her high acclaim in the industry, and today, we have the privilege of delving into her insights and experiences right here on the podcast. Without further ado, let's dive in. Well, Dr. Edwin Williams, thank you so much for joining. You're a huge mentor to me and our whole community. Um, thank you for being here. This is a business podcast. Um, some of the folks listening may not know who you are. So for those who aren't familiar, maybe give us about a minute of your background and everything you've built over the last, dare I say, three decades. Yeah, so... Uh... I'm a fake, double board certified facial plastic surgeon. I went into practice in 1992 after fellowship and, you know, always had somewhat of an entrepreneurial spirit. So I kept adding what I call, you know, profit centers or profit less centers, you know, I mean, um, but what that really means is I uh, have made every mistake out there, probably, you know, that everyone has. Um, we have a 23 and a half thousand square foot facility that we finally after 33 years uh, occupy the entire facility um you know number of doctors at medical spa an ambulatory surgery center um and a couple different offices as well and that's it um i've been very involved with the afprs for years uh my my passion if there's such a thing <clears throat> because i think that word is used to uh liberally these days you know People talk about being passionate about facelifts. I don't know if that's even possible. You know, I love doing facelifts and I, but I always have been very passionate about mentoring and teaching the next generation. So that is something I can, I can truly say is something I'm kind of passionate about. And that's why, you know, I applaud you for doing this. And I, um, you know, it's, it's, I'm not going to say no, it's, I am, by the way, I learn something every single time I do something. So that's why. I do this and we have to help each other. So that's it. That's me in a nutshell. I have a family. I got four kids and a wife. Um, my kids, my, our youngest is in college. So we're actually glad we like each other still. And we just got back from Italy spending about 10 days together. And that was pretty cool. Um, yeah. In Tuscany and eating and a lot of food, drinking a lot of wine. <laughs> so that sounds incredible. And yes, to like each other after that many years is a feat for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you, really, especially in this world. <laughs> you mentioned that you've made every mistake in the book. Yeah. What's one of the biggest obstacles you didn't anticipate and how did you work to overcome it? Um, well, probably one of the biggest obstacles that I um, didn't anticipate was being naive. Um, you know, we finish our training there's just tons of camaraderie, you know, we all help each other. We're a team. And then, you know, I went to a town where 
<clears throat> you know, I was the first facial plastic surgeon. It was an eight person plastic surgery group. And so, you know, it's hard to find that people don't like you and for no reason other than you're different and that you are a threat. And then there's other people that are, you know, I like old laryngologists. I, I thought they would be my allies and they, and they are now, I know them all, we're all friends, you know, but back then, you know, there was jealousy, you know, they're thinking that, oh yeah, he says he's going to do facial plastics, but he's going to be doing our sinus stuff. And, and then I put this building in and, you know, the comments I got, um, I don't know. So, and, um, you know, you have to throw gross and thick skin early on. I don't think you should let it ruin your good nature, but there's some of the lessons I learned early on, you know, others are, um, boy, and, and you know, it's not easy, but, um, you can't be too nice. Um, you just can't be too nice. You know, you, you're too nice. You get the shitty anesthesia, per, you know, shittiest anesthesia person. They start your cases late. And, you know, and I think, I, I mean, I'm saying this because I got three girls. I think it's tough as a woman, too, because, you know, if you, you're a little bit of a hard ass, you just, you're a bitch, you know? So, uh, you know, and I think, no, talk I think it's. Talk more I, about that. Like, how do you balance being too nice? Because it's something that I very much struggle with both with vendors, with reps, with, you know, your team that's facing, patient facing. I, um, how have you changed your, your approach to things through the years and where do you kind of sit now? Yeah. Um, no, really, a really good question because I don't think you should stop being nice. You know, I, I, I think that I still am a very kind person. I, uh, but, um, I, you know, I did a personality profile testing years ago and, and, um, and I think you can be a little different. I'm a different person at work. Um, you know, I got my game face on, um, I'm very calculated now. I make sure I spend time with our team. I make sure that I'm not just focusing on my work when I'm at work. So uh, I, I, realize the importance of being a good leader. That was the other thing I, I think in the early days I was so focused on, I was very industrious and so for focusing on my work done that I didn't slow down enough to realize the most important thing to everyone else is, you know, I'm, I'm happy if, you know, if we hit certain numbers and I've done a great job and whatever, but the, but, but building a team and the rah-rah, if you want to call it, that's, it's really important to people. Um, didn't mean I wasn't nice. It just meant I, um, you know, so how do you do that? I think you have to have certain, I hate this because it sounds so cliched, but certain boundaries and rules at work that may be different than your boundaries and rules at home. And I don't, um, I, I don't socialize with people that I work with. Um, you know, my next life, I'll be friends with them. And that does not mean <clears throat> that I don't, um, I'm not kind to them. I don't ask. I don't know their families. I I just think that I made a few of those. I made a number of those mistakes. And I've seen other colleagues of ours make those mistakes, not having real solid boundaries around your work team and your home team. Right. Home, you know, your, your home, you know, your, your home and your people, your family are your people. And, um, yeah, I, you know, I have one daughter who's, one daughter's an ophthalmologist. She's worked with us a bit and another one who's now working with us. And it's interesting because she sees me as a very different person at work. And she said to me once, oh, probably five years ago, she's like, dad, honestly, I didn't even, like, I knew what you did, but I really didn't, like, I really didn't really know, like, what you've been up to all these years. You know, you take off in the morning because I don't, I, I try to keep them separate. And I think that's important. Um and it not it doesn't mean it's just it's really hard to be impartial to everyone when you when you're friendly with you know when you're socializing with you know your manager and these are some of the biggest mistakes I made early on. How long did it take you to see those as mistakes? Was there uh, like some critical ten, incident that that ten, ten years? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll give you one example. <clears throat> 
had a, a patient cancer year, patient kit PCC that was with us for 23, 24 years. She was my longest standing person on the team, uh, other than Susan Sullivan, who's been with us now for been with me now 28 years. But, um, you know, Marianne got to be friendly. My wife actually hired her and she kind of grew in the practice and she was she was a pretty influential person because she was one of our patient concierge and back in the day only had one so you know it was marianne and we do thanksgiving with her marianne um had a little side business she used to cut hair so uh i'm an efficiency freak right so uh once a month i say hey marianne do you mind you know bring it or i text her you mind bringing in your your stuff and she cut by like i know i had 15 20 minutes somewhere during the day and i wore a day i'd finish i'd come up you know, she'd cut my hair, you know, I'd give her 20 bucks or something, just like, you know, kind of thank you. Um, but Marianne, you know, we had a personal relationship and because we'd done Thanksgiving together and we'd spent some time together, she got to be friendly with my wife and then she's cutting my hair. So, you know, she had my ear um, in a way that other people didn't. And it created some created some problems. And that's a little example, but I can go on and on and on. And I think that's, uh, you know, I, I'll tell you, I had a, an ophthalmologist once, you were talking about health insurance. And he said, he was talking about one plan versus another. And he was, oh, Ed, well, no, that's really good for your staff. You know, you don't want that for your family. That's not what I'm talking about. That to me is, you know, patronizing. And, you know, we're all the same level. You know, we're, we're a team. You'll never hear me call my, you know, my team. You'll never hear me refer to them as my staff. I, I find that's, um, you know, it's it's demeaning. And I, I hear it all the time. People always refer to their people as their, as their staff. And uh, in fact, I have some of my managers who'll make a reference to their staff. And I'm like, oh, no, no, we're guys, we're a team, you know. Um, so it, I, I, I find it offensive when people, you know, say, well, I don't socialize because, you know, you know, I'm different social circles. No, I, I, there's some of them I would love to socialize with. I just think it's hard for me to be effective and be impartial when we are, um, when we're hanging out together. That's all. Does that mean there is a difference, right? For sure. Yeah, definitely a difference. Um, and something that's kind of very much in the gray zone a lot of days, especially when you're in the OR all day with the same three people and you really want to chat about stuff, you know, get to know them, get to know their family, all that. But problem with that though, I, I, you know, they know a lot of my personal life. I know a lot of their personal life. And I think that's important that we all know each other. I just, you know, social hanging with, it just, that's where I draw the line. I mean, I just, you know, Susan Sullivan and I have been together for, like I said, 28, 29 years, and rarely will you ever see us in the same vehicle together. I don't want to, I don't ever want rumors. I don't want, it's, it just, it, it, it screws up the dynamics in my experience. You are unique in that you're one of the very successful surgeons who's brought on other surgeons into your practice and have really grown a huge team. Talk a little bit about what has led to your success in attracting and retaining other surgeons. Yeah. Um, I made some mistakes, by the way. You know, I had a couple, I had a couple failures. Um, one was a plastic surgeon. Uh, I was too nice. I'll be honest. I was too nice to him. Um, and the other was kind of by default, long story. But um, so what is, what has been our success for me i have very accurate legal and accounting that to me is paramount and that's where you got to start because and when you are bringing someone on you have to be very very you have to live by the same rules you can't have more you know if you're going to bring someone on and you're going to because i mean i could talk forever about equity what's equity right but if you're going to share equity, even if it's a 2% or an 8% or 12% or whatever the, the equity piece is, if you own stock in another company, everybody owns stock, gets the same voice or no voice. Now, if if um, some one person owns a lot more equity than the other, then naturally they're going to have, um, uh, you know, there, there are equity-based decisions. If you read 
Ray Dalio's book. He does a beautiful job, uh, his book called Principles. But what I've really tried to do is to, uh, and day one, when you talk to someone about, you know, you bring someone on, it's a salary-based position and you can have a performance piece. The first thing I do, I believe that after 18 months, you know whether this person's part of you, you're going to be part of your team or not, you know? Um, so why make it a two or three year path to partnership? To me, that's just abuse. That's just using the, using the junior person. And I've seen that. The other thing is everything's got to be laid out from the beginning. I can't tell you, because I have a lot of people who ask me, um, you know, can you give me some guidance? Can you give me some, because I, I'm looking at this, this situation and, and, and invariably the ones that fall apart and probably 98% of them, right? Um, well, here's what it is. And when it gets time, we'll talk about what partnership looks like. Um, I do just the opposite. Um, I, you know, tell them it's exactly what it looks like. Uh, I live by the same rules. We have the same spending allowance. Uh, we're on a performance base. I don't take just so no one can ever question it. I, uh, I don't take any additional from managing the practice. I have the largest piece of equity, so I'd be out of my mind to leave that up for chance. And by the way, you know, is is uh, share value goes up. And by the way, I've had this not happen a number of times. And you know, uh, one of my partners just left to go to the West Coast a year ago. He, he and his wife, you know, picked up and move and. You know, his, his stock was worth three times what he, you know, what he paid for it. And he got very nice distributions all along the way. So my it works if you do it correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is the key to success. And then when you, when the day that partnership is offered, okay, um, you have to have a valuation of, you know, a fair market, reasonable fair market valuation of what that equity is worth. Um, I had one of my former fellows, you know, he, and, you know, I, I, I mentored him and gave him advice and I told him what I was concerned about. And, um, you know, a few years later, go, actually, I've had two recent fellows and same exact situation. Um, you know, at the end of, a, you know, two years, uh, well, when am I going to be a partner? When am I going to be a partner? And, you know, uh, and one of them in particular, he, he said he, he pushing and pushing and pushing and, you know, the senior partner's like, well, you know, okay. And he, he says, well, can you tell me how's that structured? And, you know, wrote it down the back of a napkin at dinner. <laughs> Here's what it's worth. You know, and to me, if you can't open your books, then you, and, and my, by the way, my managers, my team, I was, I was adamantly opposed. I was opposed to this as well. Uh, my, um, my key people uh, and, you know, managers, people in our key positions, uh, we see they see the profit loss statements, um, and if you talk to and I and I had a real hard time with this in the beginning. I think a lot of us have a hard time with this sharing our financials. But um, I have, you know, if they're paid and there's a benchmark for what you know, a CFO, someone just asked me the other day, and you know, how do you know what to pay people? Well, a CFO of a business, it's a $3 million business, a $10 million business, a $15 million. There's met, there's benchmarks out there. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, if they're paid better than the benchmark for your geographic, they're doing well. Uh, I have no problem them seeing what I get paid because I'm up, I'm on a performance model. I don't have a base salary. So, um, but I think yeah, the approach for your whole team, like your nurses and no, people that aren't no, necessarily in higher. No, yeah. So, so depending on which state you're in, so it's only for the MDs, uh, depending on which state you're in, um, in, in New York state, <clears throat> the office of medical misconduct, you look up medical, medical misconduct is called revenue sharing with a non-physician. It's right there, black and white. And I don't care. You know, so how do you get around that? And, and sorry, not revenue sharing, just their salary. Well, if you're a performance a performance based model and it's a nurse uh, injector, that's revenue sharing. Mm. Uh, they're not licensed as a doctor. It's like you can't go, um, you know, revenue. You couldn't work in a law firm and you know get a percentage of what you know what they get. So um, and office. Uh, Look up misconduct 
under, uh, you know, the American College of Surgeons it says the same thing. So our doctors are paid on, uh, on a performance, you know, and it's just a sliding scale and it goes up a little bit as they make as they make partner. But um, it's all well laid out and well thought out. And I think that's the key to doing it. And and then fairness, um, you know, when that's not easy. I've had four kids and, you know, they know how many, you know, you have more pictures of Lydia in, in your study than me, you know, and it, and it's the same with, um, you know, with doctors and uh, someone I said once, you know, what I do is like hurting cats. Fortunately, I speak feline, you know, um, because I am a surgeon, so I can relate to it. But boy, oh boy, it's it's hard to keep um, keep things fair. It really is. That's the hardest part of what I do, you know. Do you have your surgeons sign non-competes when they come on with you? I do. Yeah, I do. And I have no problem uh, looking someone in the eye. I mean, listen, we're going to invest in you. We're going to, you you know, for example, so one of the other, one of the other important parts, I believe, of making it work is you've got to, you've got to give something up. You can't say, oh, I'm going to bring you on and give you all the shit that I don't want. Right. I mean, so when Slaughter came on, I had a very robust soft tissue practice. Now, I know you have just a cosmetic practice, but you know, we do well with ours because we, we have two rooms, you know, we can run two rooms. I mean, Slaughter did a pile of skin cancer today. And, you know, it isn't all just about making money, but it helps our surgery center. It helps him. It keeps our facility fees low. And we've locked up the area. It's also our reputation here. So these, these guys are the good guys. So, you know, I mean, I didn't have to give that to him because I, my fellows can do those cases, you know, with me and my guidance, I can be doing something else. But I gave that up to him. You know, we bought a hair train. We bought a hair practice. Now Slaughter's now starting to do a share of aging face and rhinoplasty, and whatever. But one of the biggest, other biggest mistakes that I see, well, there's a couple. One, uh, you know, see, senior surgeons get greedy. I'm just saying it. Okay. Um, and and two, their ego gets in the way. You, you know, all of a sudden they see. You know, the junior guys like booking, you know, as many facelifts and it, and it bothers them. And what I did to prepare for that is I lived a pretty, um, I want to use the word frugal. You know, I, I lived a pretty conservative existence. And that's why if you read The Millionaire Next Door, the wealth of this country is in the hands of the small businessmen. You know, we all know CEOs that make multiple, you know, six, ten, six, seven, eight figures, but the reality is most of the wealth. And the reason why is small business people don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So they live a conservative lifestyle. And why is this important? First of all, I don't want my kids to, you know, I, I certainly have much more of a lifestyle now, now than I ever did. But, you know, but but back in my early years, we, we lived, a, you know, I didn't live a showy lifestyle. And my point though with that is that uh, one day you wake up and you've got more than you'll ever need and you can afford to give stuff away, you know? Whereas if you've got a big lifestyle and and I just had this recently happen. Again, one of my former fellows calls me up and he's like, you know, he's telling me about all the extravagant things that his senior partner has. And yet, you know, he wants to keep him right over here. You know, here, you stay over here and... You know, the whole mushroom thing. And I think that's where there, there's a multitude of factors. One is being very forthright with your accounting and your, and your, and, um, but again, let's talk about a non-compete. I mean, if I'm going to give, give you, we bought a hair transplant practice. Okay. We paid for that and bought it, took risk. Mm -hmm. It's yours to run with. We're building a website with your name on it. There is a significant amount of damage if you just pick up and leave, especially if you pick up and leave and compete with us. So, so, um, you know, it's, it's, I feel strongly, I know without getting into politics, you know, there's a big push to get away with non-competes because, uh, and I, quite frankly, the government wants, the government wants to do away with non-competes because a doctor can go across town and make more money and the government gets more payroll tax. And that's the only reason they want it to do it. But, but the reality is if, if it's structured correctly, and this is going to be if they do get rid of it, it's it's going to be many years from now because there are damages, and they can be and if they're quantified and and they've had legal counsel, and they agree that those damages represent you know our fair market value for the damages of leaving, you know I mean a judge is not going to say well you can't work or work in this town, um you you know you're partners say well you you can break this but there's a damage to that and 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 you agree to that damage and 
um, that's likely to be looked upon favorably. And the reality is if that's a significant number, um, you know, the other partner, associate, surge, or whatever you have who has equity, um, you know, do they really want to take that on? A court battle that can go on two, three years and cost. I actually know uh, one of my former fellows ended up in a multiple seven figure, you know, court battle over, you know, litigation. It's easier to pick up and just go move a few states away, you know. So, um, but yeah, the, the, the long answer to that is, you know, the short answer is yes, but I do think if you're going to bring someone on and you're taking risk with them, you're building a team. I mean, you're bringing in nurses, you're, you know, you're hiring other people, um, you know, and, and, and I'll tell you one of the other lessons I learned early on too, is that actually you continue to learn it, but I tell this to our young, nobody, nobody, unless they have walked in your shoes, whatever that situation can understand risk. Okay. They, they, people, and this is one of the other things I was too generous with my team because, you know, and doctors tend to be, listen, doctors tend to be giving people, right? We tend to be kind people and, and we struggle and we struggle and we struggle. And now we're 38 years old and we're having this degree of financial success and we feel like we need to sometimes overly share. And I've made that mistake too, because the problem when, when you overcompensate people, you can't get rid of them. Well, you can, I mean, but it, but it's really hard to get rid of them because they, you know, you, you know, they start hold, really holding them accountable. And now all of a sudden you're like, okay, I'm holding accountable. And then they start looking around and they can't duplicate what they have with you. So they stay put. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a real balancing act with, you know, with that. So um, yeah, I do. I, I do feel non-competes are, are very fair, but uh, you know, getting back to the risk piece, people will never understand your risk ever, ever. And wait till you're 30 years out, you know, they, they weren't there during the grind, you know, the real grind. I mean, I know you're feeling it to some degree just because it's, you know, and, and maybe, maybe you got thicker skin than I did, but I got to tell you the, you know, the, I don't have any stress now. I mean, compared to back then I had hassles and headaches and stuff, but I, um, but financial stress uh, to me is the worst stress out there. Yeah, I'm, we're approaching two years and I feel like I can finally breathe a little bit financially. But the first two years, I mean, I looked at my bank account every morning and. Oh, yeah. That's I, like hear book. I mean, take it from your book out of. Yeah. And I. Yeah, it's it's nerve wracking because it's such a volatile, you know, like you were just saying, the small business person doesn't know what's around the corner or what's going to happen today or tomorrow. And so always having that in the back of my mind that the phones could stop ringing, which I know that you've been through several recessions. Uh, it's terrifying. It's very scary. You know, I mean, I, 9-11, who, who would ever predicted, predicted that, right? And 9-11 happens and my phone stops ringing. We're two hours from New York. People were walking around here in a daze for two months. So, you know, I had a bad accident on a horse once and, you know, that, that put me out for, you know, I was at an X fix and fasciotomies and all that. I was out for, you know, six, eight weeks. And anyway, the whole thing is there's there, the risk piece. And here's the other thing. As you start bringing people in, you know, you want to be fair to them, but you also want to be fair to yourself. You can't be too generous on the equity piece because um, no one will ever understand, you know, 20 years from now will ever understand the amount of risk that you took. It's just that it's been my experience. No matter how you can tell the stories, but in, unless you've lived it, um, it, it's just not the same. It, it really isn't worrying about where that, you know, I remember like having, you know, a dermatologist have two or three of them sending me cases, you know, and then all of a sudden like one stops. I'm like, what's going on? What did I do wrong? You know? Let me recall I, every case and lay awake in bed thinking about every patient. Yeah. Yeah. I've see, you see someone, you know, because I'm young, right? So I see someone for a skin cancer and, and, and you know, a bilo flap kind of, I'm like looking to schedule them and, and all of a sudden, like, you know, like I say, they call and canceled. And I'm like, well, what happened there? It's like, well, they kind of were told you should go to someone else. You know, I mean, that kind of stuff. And I mean, I'm sure you, know, you have that now happen, you know, with bigger cases like facelifts or something. And it's yeah. like, 
I remember Steve Daines when he, you know, he first went out. He was like, he called me up once. He goes, like, he goes, I'm like out of my mind. I had this woman booked, and then someone told her that, you know, I just didn't have enough experience, and I lost her. Yeah, and those things beat you up really bad. I don't now. If it happens, I'm like, good, get rid of. Them. You know, I mean, good riddance. I don't need your headache. Um, I don't need someone who's second guessing me. Goodbye. I don't. I you know, but in the early years, those things are, are really beat you up pretty, pretty bad. They did me anyway. Yeah. And you're already questioning, you know, that whole imposter syndrome or just insecurity okay. in general, it's already very real. And then when someone does something like that, it tends to validate some of your deepest, darkest thoughts. Yeah. I my, I was just say one day, my 21, 25 year old um, daughter said something about, you know, whatever. And, and just like sometimes dealing, like dealing with imposter you know, syndrome and she was, I just, I got to like deal with it, get over it or something. I'm like, or something I forget. And I said, I said, Riley, you never get over it. You know, I, 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 to me, like, it still blows my mind the, that people like respect me. So like, I'm, I'm like, what did I, you know, I'm, I'm pulling this off. Like I'm somehow pulling this off. So just know that it, it's something you don't ever really get over. You know, it's it's a really thing. And maybe that's what motivates us. Anyway, you had a question for me. Well, that's interesting because I feel like a couple of times I've gone home and told my husband, like, somehow this is all working. You know, like I'm, I'm making you know, them all. I somehow the business is actually working. And he's like, well, yeah, what do you think? And I'm like, I don't know. It's just it's surreal sometimes when you look, you stand back and look at the forest. Um, but I wanted to shift gears and talk a little bit about, um, you know, you have a lot of patients that come and visit you from elsewhere. What things did you and your team do or do you do and how have things morphed over the years in terms of when traveling surgical patients come in and, and stay with you guys, what are some little things that your team does to help them feel more comfortable more at ease during this huge process that is surgery? Um, obviously, some of it's just really good TLC and care. I mean, you know, and and um, we, we are now working on trying to put together some special things for that. And I, I'll, I'll tell you one lesson I learned. It's not what you give if it's if it's thoughtful it means like for example you know you hear these some people you know the patient goes to the hotel room and they got a big bouquet of flowers i mean that's so cliched right but we're, we're trying to put together just some destination some ba packages that look like okay maple syrup from the area it's something you know about the area and that kind of thing I, I don't really know that there's anything we try to um you know overstaff on the patient concierge side so that they have the time to spend with those people, whether it's accommodations, um, they have the time to stop down to the OR just before their case and say hello to them and check in the day before. And, you know, those kind of things, uh, you know, see them in the post-op period versus be too, too busy for that. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think really just trying to put just thoughtful, you know, meaningful, thoughtful things that don't need to cost you a lot of money, except yeah. maybe, they cost you team, you know, your people time, but just making it a focus. Um, and I think that's, it does make it, that's one thing that does make it a little easier when you have, you know, you're doing just cosmetic practice. You do have just an aesthetic practice. What we did about seven or eight years ago, maybe more, um, maybe eight or nine years ago now, we completely separated the insurance and cosmetic division. And we did that because it is very hard for your team to switch gears um, uh, and for, focus. Like separate teams in your clinic that- We do, yeah. Uh, we have some people that are just on insurance. Other than the 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 nurse, the, the nurses, or some of the nurses will go back and forth. But as far as the admit people and um, the folks who do the billing and take the phone calls, I'll give you a story, I'll give you an example. Um, a few years ago, we had a PCC and I made me, this is what made me realize we have got to separate it. And sure enough, we separate it and the cosmetic stuff grew. Um, so that's, that's the downside of having an insurance mix in your, pro I do think it's hard to do. We, we did it for years, having them use the same share, separate physical space, separate waiting rooms, everything now. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And it's just, um, I had one of my team members who was upset over that. She said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to treat people differently. And I said, look, 
um, the the people who come here uh, are are patients who come to the insurance. They get world class care here. You know, surgical care, patient care, you name it. But when you go to the Ritz, you get a different level of service than when you go to the Super Eight. I'm sorry, it's the way it is. Mm-hmm. And if you if you have a problem with that, maybe you need to be in a different country. But the reality is, we can't afford. You know, we 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 don't scrimp on is is delivering to our patients, but but um, it, you know, is something more like if it's an insurance patient with a question, are they more likely to go to a voicemail? Yeah, they are. If it's an inquiry and a facelift, man, they get you know they're so you and 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 until we separated the way the patients were managed and where they were seen, um it does undermine your cosmetic practice. There's no question. Um, you know, and I'm a realist. I'm not going to, you know, believe, make believe that it is. Anyway, so I was starting to tell you, Jackie, who was our PCC, I remember this is like the day, it was like the epiphany. I, she said, oh, I, I just, I just feel so bad. I spent an hour on the phone with this woman from Florida who wants to come for Dr. Polonies. Anyway, she was a woman um, and she felt so bad. She's getting a run around. It, it was a, it was insurance-based breast reduction that he was never going to get you know they were never going to get didn't have the sources to get on a plane and you know and so jackie because she's a very caring individual it can't differentiate between a person in need you know and that's why you have to separate them Uh, i feel very strongly about that i if you're gonna i know you don't do it you know you don't have an insurance-based practice but we we've had the opportunity to get rid of it many times and it's just it's part of who we are at this point. And like I said, there are enough financial reasons to keep it too. Um, but I, I, I think that's, that's been something that's helped us. So as far as, uh, you know, in trying to, you know, if patients are willing to come from a distance. Um, I do think that they, you know, deserve to get treated. You know, I mean, someone's going to get in an airplane and come see you or drive through four hours. I think that's, you know, it, it uh, they need to be able to feel that. So I think most of it, you know, thoughtful things and making the time. What makes uh, a good fellowship director? You've hosted many fellows over the years. And if someone young, like my generation of surgeons is looking into the future a few years, if any of us are interested in starting a fellowship program, what goals or, you know, who should we strive to be as a mentor to the younger generations, surgically, business-wise, all of the things? Look, I don't, we all have different, I mean, not everyone, everyone has business acumen, right? So that's not a critical component of the fellowship, I don't believe. I think what is a critical component of the fellowship, though, and a very important part of it is to be a good mentor. And to be a good mentor, you have to take a genuine interest. And um, and I do. I, I mean, I take a genuine interest in our fellow success. I want to see them successful. I get communication on a regular basis from them looking to leave, you know, a situation, looking to put a building in. Um, but you, it's, it's like having, uh, I mean, it's no different than having children. You have to give them time. Mm-hmm. You know, we're in, in, in a cosmetic fellowship. I mean, I can't let the fellows do a lot of the case. You know, uh, I did all that. I did it in the VA. I did it for years. All the skin cancer, the fellows do all the case. But, you know, if I'm doing, you know, I mean, for, I remember probably seven, eight years ago, maybe it was maybe two, three years after I transitioned and I really felt like I had deep playing down. I let the fellows raise the flaps and, you know, I'd end up with buttonholes and the smash. And I'm like, I can't do that anymore, you know? So I don't think letting the fellow do the surgery is the answer. Um, and I got to tell you, you know, I trained, trained, with, trained with Gene Tardy and I learned an awful lot. You know, if a fellow, if, if you, when I pick, fellows i want to make sure that they're good surgeons and they're well trained i can't teach them how to do surgery in a year you know mm-hmm. to me about um helping their development as a surgeon helping their development as a human being um tim minton said to me 
finished in 2010. He said, you know, I, I, you know, I did this because of, you know, I, I knew your business acumen and whatever. I didn't know I was going to get a life coach. You know, to me, that was a compliment because, I, um, but it's no different than having kids. If you don't take a genuine interest in them, you know, you don't have a relationship with them. Right. So I, I think that really taking an interest in their career, their development, their decisions, um, is important. It's very different than a, it's very different than a residency because it is more. How many fellows have you had now? 24, 25, something like that. Yeah. We just, now we're doing two a year. So, you know, we get a double, we get, you know, two, two at once, but um, yeah. And I know, you know, I know them all. I know their families and their kids. Not well, no, but I know, you know, the kids' names and, and, um, you know, you spend, you spend, uh, I, I would dare say some of my better, you know, best friends are my former fellows now because, um, you know, you, you share a year together and, uh, you know, there's good, there's good times and there are bad times too. I've, I can tell you stories. Uh, we've all been through bad shit, right? So, you know, it could be me at the time. Um, yeah, I've been through my share of stuff too. You know, I had, had a house burned down with all the contents and the dogs and, you know, and uh, that was a really, uh, that was a, uh, that was a tough, tough time. Um, I've had fellows who've had health problems. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's taking a genuine interest in, 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 and I will tell you the wrong reason to do it, honestly, is for, um, you know, just to think for the, whatever you think, cachet, prestige, whatever you want to call it. I had one person who's a fellowship director, call me once uh, like he's thinking about he goes you know i i, I want to bring a fellow on i just think you don't have to dictate any of the op reports they're sucking fat i can go have a cup of coffee i'm like that's not really why you take a fellow you know so that's the wrong reason but you know we all know who those people are you, you know it's interesting too because i know some fellowship directors that i know at a certain i know a certain way right and then you know you you hear from applicants who hear from fellows who you have that that person's really a jerk. <laughs> so, you know, um, it's such an, it's such an important role, and I feel like, you know, thank you to you and all the teachers out there that are teaching the next generation of surgeons. Because, yeah, there's just so much that goes into teaching, and it really does slow you down, and it takes a huge part of your brain space throughout the day. I imagine. And, it's uh, it, you're leaving, you're leaving your legacy, which is I, uh, really I, get lot, I get a lot out of it, and selfishly, you know, it's like when your kids do well. Um, there's a lot of satisfaction of that, and um, I didn't have, um, you know, for fellowship director, I did not have a good good mentors. You know, I mean, Dr. Tardy was, you know, so I, I at the time he was younger than I am now, right? But I just think he was beyond it and you know so he really couldn't be a mentor and um you know uh, the younger fellowship director was so into his career that it wasn't didn't really take a personal interest in us at all and um and I always you know I remember thinking that I'll never be like that you know I want to make sure that I'm a better person than that than that and you know make so uh, yeah, I do think it's, and that's why I think I told you way back when, when I was talking to you, don't discount it, be, you know, don't discount because I, I will tell you that, uh, I've had more satisfaction and get more gratification from, um, you know, having a fellowship than pretty much anything else I've done. So, um, you know, my current fellow, um, Matt, uh, Urban is going down, he's starting his own practice and, um, you know, he was looking at a bunch of different opportunities and basically I helped him. He identified a practice down there. I kind of gave him guidance. I really encouraged him to go in a certain direction. And, uh, you know, I had, I had, a I you know, flew us down there one day just to spend time and, and, uh, spend time with the guy who was looking to buy the practice with to help with negotiations. You know, he's never, he's never going to forget that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, selfishly, I get a lot out of it, too. I really do. I learn. You know, I said, I told him, I said, you know, the reason I wanted to go down there and, and 
and look this guy in the eye and talk to him is, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I, I, you know, I want to know, I want him to know how good you are, but I also, I want to be able to listen to him and look him in the eye and get a feel. Is this guy somebody that, you know, you are willing to, you know, because if I don't care how good the, the legal work and the paperwork is, if you don't have a good person on the other side. So mm -hmm. me just going down, spending a few hours with this guy was worth it. And so, um, but he'll never forget that. Right. I think he's grateful. I mean, you know, he, um, you know, he, he's like, there's no way I would have the confidence to make that kind of offer or make an offer on it without, you know, so yeah, that's to me, that's, and it's fun. Well, rounding out our discussion, what do you see in your future? What does the next five to 10 years hold? What are you excited about? What are you looking forward to? Um, I'm going to continue, you know, I don't, I'll tell you, it's, a, it's a, I just turned 65. So it's a really weird thing. I'm not going to be one of these people doing surgery in my 70s. That I know. I don't need to do another facelift. I don't need to do another rhinoplasty. I don't want to see our revenue stream drop, uh, you know, with me walking away from it at this point. Uh, I have a lot to teach. Um, I probably will do a little less at our national meetings, but I do want to continue to leverage my experience. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know if you knew this, but I, uh, I have, uh, first of all, the growth in our industries in the non-surgical, I know that. And, and the equity piece on the surgical practice isn't worth a lot. It mm -hmm. just is, you know, I mean, we're a pain in the ass to deal with surgeons. We, you know, we're too subject to the economy. It, it's not something you can scale up. But um, I have, uh, you know, partnered from an equity point of view with uh, Alpha uh, Alpha Par uh, Aesthetics because, um, you know, to me, I'm not going to ignore this opportunity. Um, the non-surgical space is going to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, again, I'm just moving equ equity around into different places. But, um, you know, we're going to scale this up, economy of scale. I mean, I have been... I've been in this industry for 33 years. We, you know, you do things at a very high level, have worked so hard to do this the right way. And we have these non-surgical med spas popping up all over the place that, you know, this, and this does, has nothing to do with a degree because I've seen some phenomenal PAs and MPs who've been at it for 15, 20 years. But whether it's a, you know, an MD, ER doc who's all of a sudden now is passionate about, you know, aesthetics, passionate like i'm not even passionate about faceless as much as i love doing them um so i we have got to come up with a high level standardization high level training that is not just you know based on the companies i mean the companies do a great job but they have their agenda too they're very biased yes. they're very, so what we're doing uh with um with that, you know, with Alpha is we're putting together Alpha Academy. We're going to get, you know, a couple of rock stars, high level people that are very objective and put, put it, you know, training protocols and elevate the field. I mean, when I see the stuff that people are doing out there, I mean, I won't do thread lifts. I don't know you, I don't want to get, but I'm going to tell you right now, I, I've been doing it for, I've been in this industry for a long time. I did them. Okay. I can't understand why they've made a way back, especially. It makes no sense to me at all. You got to cut, remove tissue, and elevate it. You can't just pull it and expect it to hold. We learned that with Gore-Tex slings 30 years ago. Like, why is that going to change now? So, and yet, I got a med spot down the road who's got, you know, an internist who's doing thread lifts in the nose. I mean, we, so I'm looking, this is what, now, okay, now you, you know, you can tell, right? I start getting excited that I, I am passionate about keeping our industry at the highest level and on the non-surgical side as well and scaling that up because, uh, it, you know, the surgeons are going to stand to lose if we don't because um, you're competing with all this noise out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do think it's hard for patients who are not in the industry to decipher they, the noise. They, they don't know. I will tell you, though, that I think quality always still wins. 
quality will always win. Um, but there are people popping up, you know, doing things that I just can't believe they're doing. You know, and it does, by the way, they're passionate about it until they're not making enough money. And now they're doing the skinny shot. You know, I mean, it's just it blows my mind. So I'm I'm working hard, you know, and my I'm, my loyalties with facial plastic surgeons, obviously. But but uh, anyone who's doing it at a high level to really keep our industry at the highest level possible. It's I've just seen a big I've seen and I think social media has made it worse because now all of a sudden you got these, you know, yeah. There are there are workshops how to become a key opinion leader. I mean, can can you believe it? People are paying five grand to go learn how to you know. It's just it, it, so. How about just like, like teach honestly and publish papers and stuff like that. So yeah. that's that's where I want to. My mark, my make isn't my mark isn't to continue doing surgery into my seventies. I, I you know there's a lot of younger people out there can can do a fine job. So I, I'm looking to you know make my leave my legacy on our industry and continue to help and mentor people. You know, I mean, I find that part fun. So I know it was a long answer, but. I know it's, it's a great answer and something that I look forward to seeing you grow and learning kind of how you contribute to the industry. Um, Well, thank you for your time today, Dr. Williams, again, and thank you for our, on behalf of all the younger facial plastic surgeons out there who have learned a lot from you personally, you at meetings, you through books, and your own podcast, um, The White Coat Investor. Um, if someone is wanting to reach out to you, is there a good way? Um, what's your yeah. website? Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I have, I'll give you my, my personal email is just ewilliams at williamsurgery.com. But, um, you know, just going through with a white coat investor, I think it's on, I, I think it's on Dr. Edwin Williams. I don't even know. But there's an email link that you can email to. But, you know, I'm always, like I said, I, I'm always, uh, to my, to me, I enjoy it. So I don't consider it a hassle. In fact, I find it, you know, refreshing. And I am very, as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm loyal to our specialty. And I think this is something we have to really take seriously. You know, we talk about hustle, hustle like your boat, but we have to protect um, our specialty. And we need to get your generation really involved with the academy because, um, you know, if the academy goes away, you know, it's hard to believe that we could ever be in a position where we couldn't call ourselves what we call ourselves. But that could happen. It's just like a vote, you, you know, all of a sudden if the wrong place and people are in the wrong place. So it's hard now because we have so much momentum and we've we have high level quality, but it's uh, it's easy. It's easy for, you know, for us to rest our laurels. Right. Well, thank you again so much. Well, thank you for having me on and, you know, thank you for the kind words. And I, and I applaud you, Laura, for, you know, um, for doing this. I really do. I think it's great. Um, you know, the sharing is, is terrific. And, um, if you ever need anything from me, let me know. All right. Thank you for joining us this week on the Business of Aesthetic podcast series brought to you by our gold sponsors, Equa Marketing. Would you like to join our growing group of aesthetic industry experts and get featured on the Business of Aesthetics podcast? Or do you know someone who would love to share their strategies for growth in the aesthetic business, providing quality patient care or their clinical expertise? head over to www.businessofaesthetics.org slash podcast show and apply to be featured as a guest on the show. Remember to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen. If you would like to engage with today's speakers or any of our past speakers, join our Facebook group or LinkedIn group by searching for Business of Aesthetics. Thank you and have a great day.